Well, the UK has passed the tipping point for EVs, so why don't we see far more EVs on the roads? I'm Dave. Welcome to Dave Takes It On. Well, exactly what is a tipping point and what happens next? A tipping point is a point after which things change forever, cannot be reversed. So a quick example, put a glass in the middle of a table, push it one inch, two and a half centimetres, the glass moves an inch. But that's it, everything else remains unchanged. It's just a bit nearer the edge of the table. Push it again, same thing, push it again, same thing. It just gets closer and closer. You keep going and you'll eventually reach the point where the glass will be right on the edge. Well, in fact, it'll be overhanging the edge, but still firmly on the table, totally safe. But you know that now, if you push it just the next inch, which you've done thousands of times before, this time it will overbalance. It will fall off the table and it will smash on the floor. You can never get the glass back as it was. Well, it might not seem like it, but generally a tipping point is when the sales of the new product exceed around 10% of all the sales of that product. And EVs are currently at a nearer 17%. So let's see how EVs are affected by a tipping point relating to cars on the road. Well, looking at product tipping points is actually fascinating. So let's just have a quick look at one that happened recently for real. Before the mid 90s, when the first digital cameras arrived, we had film cameras. Now, realise many of you youngsters, you don't even know what these things are. So a quick explanation. Uh, you bought and loaded a physical film, either a roll or cassette. Uh, it had 12, 24 or 36 frames, pictures on it. And you put it into a lightproof camera. You wound the film on out of the uh, container uh, onto the first frame. When you press the shutter, open the light entered and formed an image on the film. But you couldn't see it. Uh, when you finished all of the frames, you wound it on each time, then at the very end you wound it all back into the cassette to protect it from any further light, which would destroy all the pictures. You took it down to a chemist or sent it to a photo lab in the post, which developed the film, turning it first into negatives, which were then printed the right way around. You got back post -size, postcard sized hard copies. And if you got things wrong, this was the first you found out about it. It was when you picked up the photos, looked at them and, oh no, he's looking the wrong way. I'd be hand in front of the lens, whatever. But in the early 90s, the first digital camera was launched, followed immediately by the first mobile phones with a digital camera on board. Quality was quite appalling compared to photographs, but it had two huge advantages. First, it was instant. You could see what you'd just taken there and then. And second, it was free. So your film cost you money, you had to buy it. Developing a photograph cost you money, you had to pay for it. But digital was free. Once you got your camera, you could take as many as you wanted, or as many as you had memory for. And you can actually delete the rubbish ones as you went along, freeing up space. So quickly, the quality improved, a bit like computers, just doubled, doubled again until by the end of the 90s, the quality was really quite good. Not good enough for professional use in posters or magazines, but really quite good. Well, the tipping point for film cameras was passed. Those that didn't have a digital camera or a mobile phone with a camera didn't just throw away their old film cameras. No, they carried on buying film for their cameras. But those that did, obviously, they just stopped buying film. It was not a switch, a sudden dramatic change um, that you could see. It was a transition. One day, absolutely everyone who wanted a photograph bought a film. The next day, some of those people started buying digital cameras our phones and simply stop buying films. Well by 2003, just three years later, the sale of digital cameras overtook film cameras and shortly after that with the arrival of the smartphone in 2007, the quality reached such a level that the phone on your smartphone was now so good you didn't even need a digital camera. Now that transition took about 20 years. But the key here was that people did not immediately throw away their film cameras. They first just stopped buying new films, then they stopped using them altogether. Some people were still using film a decade later, some professionals still do to this day. But the absolute vast majority of people simply stopped buying film cameras, then they stopped buying digital cameras until today, the vast majority of people simply use their smartphones. Many real enthusiasts, we're the same, um, we carry on using digital cameras. But again, we're few and far between. The vast and overwhelming majority of the population now just use their smartphones and they are really good. So back to EVs. We see almost exactly the same happening, but with two huge differences. Well, almost everyone can afford a digital camera or smartphone. The, the Tesco's 50 quid. 
uh, most people cannot afford a new car of any sort, let alone an EV. And second, most people already have a perfectly good and usable car. Many of those will be on finance, some in many cases already being paid off and they're for free, and that should last them many years. The tipping point has been reached. EVs now will be getting cheaper and cheaper and cheaper, and as they do, they'll sell more proportionally each year. But the tipping point works both ways. Think back to film versus digital cameras. Some drivers who currently drive a petrol or diesel car will decide that the age of petrol and diesel has reached the end and they will choose not to replace their current car with another ICE car. They may not buy anything, they may just stop buying altogether and will just hold on to their old car for longer. And we already see this happening. The average length of time we keep our cars has been growing over the last decade. Then as the price of EVs continues to fall, it will reach a point when those people suddenly go, hey, now's the time to buy an EV. But at the same time, the sales of ICE cars will continue to decline. And the logical conclusion of this is twofold. The new EVs will reach a critical mass where the cost of production trump tumbles, making them even more affordable, while the sales of ICE cars will fall below that critical mass and the cost of production for them will start to rise sharply. EVs get cheaper, ICE get much dearer, and quickly the EVs will price match, then rapidly become far cheaper to buy. And at that point, even the last die-hard enthusiasts will also stop buying ICE cars and reluctantly buy the first EV. If you go into a showroom, they've got identical cars, petrol and EV, and the EV is cheaper, it's tempting. Well, this process is already underway. The tipping point has already been passed. EVs are now on a price parity for the actual purchase price. And for those who can charge it home, the running costs of an EV on off-peak cheap electricity are just stupidly cheaper than buying petrol or diesel. While the drivers who cannot charge it home will still suffer, and they will hold out the longest. But the number of drivers who can charge cheaply at home or work vastly outnumbers them. And no driver in his right mind, or her right mind, will refuse to buy a cheaper EV with cheaper running costs for themselves just because someone else can't. That's a ridiculous argument. It's like saying that because 40% of youngsters today cannot afford to buy the first house and get onto the property ladder, that we should ban the building and selling of all new houses to those that can actually afford them. That's crazy. That's not the way society works. And before EV haters claim that ICE sales are rising, let's see what the industry experts say. You see, an increasing number of new cars are simply being sold and forced into dealers who don't want them, can't sell them on to end customers. And they just sit in dealers across the country and the world. Then there's a huge rise in the number of ICE cars being registered as dealer test vehicles or service loan vehicles. It's a ruse. These are often held for just a few weeks, sometimes a month, then they're sold on at a discount. Add in the massive number of new cars that just blatantly pre-registered to boost sales figures and then immediately sold on as a really low mileage demo car or whatever at huge discounts. And we accuse the Chinese of dumping cheap vehicles onto the market. ICE has been doing this for years. These are everywhere, loads of them in the UK. So are new ICE cars selling? Well, the inventory, inventory levels would show not. Industry average and ideal level is around 60 days of stock. This level is not too many to be a burden on finances, nor too few to run short if a delivery is delayed. Yet only two manufacturers, Honda and Toyota, are below that. Three are slightly above, and all the rest significantly higher. And the leader, this is an American uh, dealer, they've got an eye-watering 255 days of stock. That's almost a year's worth of stock. That's over four times what they regard as average or ideal. So are the ICE manufacturers selling cars in record numbers? Well, they're not to the general public. They just sell them on to themselves where they're financed. And people quote sales having risen 2023 by 17.9% in the USA or 10% globally, but compared to what? Best year ever? No, this is compared to 2022 and 2021 which is one of the lowest year for sales in the last decades because we are coming out of lockdowns and entering the horrendous worldwide part shortage and silicon chip shortages and shipping catastrophes. It actually wasn't a really tremendous amount better. Any worse, it would have been terminal. So not a great year for new sales, huge stockpiles, massive numbers registered by dealers, then sold on as used. 
That decline is the sign or confirmation uh, that we've passed the tipping point. And with several years of lockdown and several years of chip and parts and shipping shortages, the market should have been bursting at the seams, pent up demand, waiting to get new cars. We should have been queuing up to snap up cars immediately they arrived at dealers. And we weren't. But over in the EV world, buyers are snapping up pretty much all that's being made, even at silly high prices. Tesla BYD is selling all they can make, which reported that the utilisation figure that legacy auto industry needs to be profitable and survive and thrive is in the range of 80 to 85 percent. That's a, a actual production against available production. And this year, nowhere near 80 percent. The worst quarter recently, it was a frightening 71 percent utilisation. This is not new. In the last 25 years, there have only been two quarters where utilisation levels exceeded 90%. And this is not new. In the last 25 years, there have only been two quarters where utilisation levels exceeded 90%, and only a handful were exceeded 80%. That's less than 10 out of the last 100 quarters where the industry was operating efficiently and profitably. And there are scary numbers of quarters where the utilisation level fell below 70%. In fact, several times as many in the last 50 years than exceeded by 80%. Legacy auto industry has been hanging on by its fingertips for decades. Hence the repeated bankruptcy and repeated bailouts from governments around the world. Meanwhile, BYD sees earnings double 2022-23 and profits leap by 81%. Over at Tesla, record profits of over 13 billion, and they have over 29 billion cash in the bank, against a total debt of less than 2 billion. Wow, wouldn't that be nice to all you homeowners with mortgages to have 10 times more cash in your current account than the total of all your debts, including the mortgage? Well, Legacy Auto is struggling. The accountancy figures do not lie. They're seeing demand drop like a stone at a time when their early attempts at EVs are creating absolutely massive losses, tens of tens of billions they can scarce afford. The pent-up demand they relied on for all the years of the pandemic failed to exist, and their early attempts at EVs have been a total disaster and a bottomless money pit. Now, I welcome comments on how any of them are going to get out of this. I, I can see no way in the short term, no way at all. Now, in the long term, if one or two of them takes the massive leap of faith and switches totally to EVs, and invest everything they have, everything they can borrow into getting to mass production and profitability, they might just survive. But there's absolutely no appetite for such a gamble. In fact, they all seem to be just doubling down and go, oh, let's go back to ice and hybrids. Well, tipping point has been passed. EVs are here to stay, but ice are also here to stay for some time yet. Don't expect the UK to suddenly switch to EVs tomorrow. It won't and can't happen. Not that quickly. Even though you don't yet see millions on the road, EVs are on the rise. They are here to stay. Well, thanks very much for watching. If you have enjoyed the video, video please click the like button below. And if you do want to see more videos like this, please consider subscribing. It's totally free. Click the subscribe button. And if you want to be notified when we release a video, click the notification bell. Massive thank you to all our Patreon members and if you are interested in supporting the channel then have a look at our details in the Patreon uh, link down below. Uh, it's just a way of supporting the channel and we put on there things, features and photos and videos that we just don't put on uh, YouTube. I'm Dave.